talking to a dear friend of mine earlier this month about this whole TED thing, you know. And uh, so she said, so what are you going to talk about? And I said, well, I'm going to talk about being brave. And she got this really strange look on her face, and she said, but aren't you scared? <laughs> and I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I'm scared. I'm really scared. I'm scared. I'm excited. I'm all of it. And she said, well, then how can you talk about being brave? And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, if you're scared and you're talking about being brave, aren't you afraid you'll be found out? <laughs> so now you know. <laughs> But isn't that true for all of us? I mean, really, it's a fair question. How can any of us be our best, real selves, powerfully, what I call brave, if we're feeling afraid, or if we're feeling vulnerable, or anxious, or stressed, or overwhelmed? I'm sure none of you ever feel those things ever, right? How can we be our brave selves in the face of our inescapable humanity. And I would love to stand up here and tell you that I've got it all figured out and that I brought the magic pill and I'm gonna give it to all of you so we can all be brave all the time. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, turns out there is no magic pill, I know. Our brave unfolds one situation at a time. And I don't know how it's been for you, but brave doesn't always come as easily for me as I'd like it to. <laughs> you know, it hasn't always been the case. When I was a kid, it was effortless. I was like a wild pony. I grew up on a ranch in Montana, and I'd be prancing around the pasture singing at the top of my lungs. I was weird, but I was fearless. <laughs> fearless and free and completely comfortable with expressing myself in the world. And then I went to college, and I studied theater. And somewhere along the way, around that point in time, I seemed to misplace my fearlessness. It just stopped feeling safe to be me. And I, I remember going to auditions. I would be petrified. I would walk in, and my throat would constrict. And I was convinced I couldn't sing. I couldn't breathe. My hands would shake. I don't know if you've ever experienced this before, <laughs> but I felt like my entire body had betrayed me. And then, when I would miraculously get cast in spite of myself, I would step on the stage and I'd really connect with the other actors in the scene with me. And all that fear and tension and negative self-talk would just melt away. And the more I just let go and stop trying to prove myself to my director and to my classmates and just focus, the better I seemed to perform. And I had no idea what I was doing or why it worked, but when it did, it was magical. But it didn't escape me that my only safe place for self-expression at that time was hidden behind a character in a play. And the second I'd step off that stage, all those familiar sensations would come rushing back. I remember sitting, waiting for my director's feedback, my jaws clenched, my stomach tight, holding my breath as I staked my self-worth on the words that were about to come out of his mouth. <sighs> So when I look back, I think I've spent my entire adult life fighting to reclaim that sense of freedom and joy that I had when I was a kid, when I could just express who I was in the world and be who I am. And what I've learned in time as I've worked with thousands of leaders and emerging leaders, just amazing people, is that I am not the only one fighting this fight. We are all fighting to be ourselves powerfully in this world. And so over time, I developed this voracious hunger and curiosity to understand. For almost 15 years, I have been obsessed about authenticity and influence and purpose and leadership and business and communications. And when I eventually left the theater and after a very circuitous path, propelled myself into the world of training and development, the Fortune 500 employees who would find themselves in my classroom 
became my education. And over the course of the day, I'd watch them protect and defend and deflect until they felt safe enough to say what was real. And in their efforts to prove themselves to their colleagues and, and to their boss, for sure, if their boss was in the room, and maybe more than anything, prove themselves to themselves, I could see my own reflection. As it turns out, <laughs> the theater world and the business world aren't that far apart after all. <laughs> And as I was making these observations, I started to notice that I was beginning to change as I would listen intently to really understand what was going on with them. I stopped being worried about what they thought about me. <laughs> and instead, I focused completely on just creating this safe space for all of us to explore and probing to dig deeper and challenging them. And the time would just fly by. And at the end of the day, even though I'd be completely wiped out, in that moment, it felt effortless. And the crazy thing was, is the more effortless it felt, the more I was just myself and focused on them, the more I just watched them transform. I could see the light bulbs going off all over the place. The rooms would be engaged, filled with laughter. As real change was taking place right before my eyes, it was magical. And I recognized that feeling. It was the same feeling that I had when I'd be standing on the stage, really connecting with another actor in the scene with me, and I thought, if I could do this on the stage, and I could do this in the classroom, how could I do this in life? And eventually, it hit me. I had had the tools all along, and I couldn't even see them. In the theater, we learn a lot of different tools and techniques and methods to enhance performance. And one of those methods that was codified at the turn of the century in Russia by a man named Konstantin Stanislavsky was particularly powerful. Now, Stanislavsky is a really interesting guy because not only was he an actor and a director, but he was also a businessman. And he recognized that the theater was a business. And shortly after he started the Moscow Art Theater, he started to notice that there were some actors who would draw an audience in droves and some that just didn't. And so he wanted to find out, what are these people doing that are making the theater all this money? And so after a rigorous process, he discovered that the best actors, the ones who were giving the most truthful and inspired, brave, performances were somehow able to circumvent their own natural human reaction to stress and vulnerability and anxiety. And instead of focusing on themselves and their own emotions and those crazy physical sensations that would show up when you naturally find yourselves in a high stakes situation, like, hello, being in the spotlight, <laughs> these people instead could focus their attention outside themselves to ignite a live moment in time on the stage. What Stanislavski learned was, th was that these amazing people instinctively understood how to focus outside themselves. Now, many of us have a misconception about what acting is all about. When I ask my participants, they usually tell me it's all about pretend <laughs> or faking it. But the craft of acting is really about the search for truth. It's about understanding a character intimately to excavate what drives them. What do they want more than anything in the world? What is the impact they want to have? What is their purpose? And what Stanislavski learned was that when an actor is crystal clear about their character's driving need, and can concentrate their attention on achieving that need in the face of all of the obstacles in their path, that is what gives them presence. And the fact that an audience would be mesmerized or that they would leap to their feet in thunderous applause or return to the theater again and again and again and spend lots of money 
was simply a byproduct. It was a byproduct of their focus of attention on action to achieve purpose. Their why. Or as Stanislavski called it, their super objective. And what I have learned is that it works the same way off stage. That the most influential people, the best leaders, are crystal clear about this is what drives me. This is the impact I am here to have. And that clarity of purpose leads to powerful external behaviors, the way they show up in the world, the, the actions that they're taking that cause people to want to give them their best. They want to be a part of whatever you're doing. They want to listen. They want to follow. But that want is simply a byproduct. Since I made this realization about eight years ago, some brilliant work has been done that supports the insight that Stanislavski had more than a century ago. Dan Pink's work on intrinsic motivation, Brene Brown's work on vulnerability, Simon Sinek's work on purpose, Bill George's work on authenticity, just to name a few. These pioneers have made it possible for us to have the kind of conversation we're having today on a much bigger scale, to marry the internal and the external and apply it to the world of work. <sighs> Beautiful Maya Angelou once said, then once you know better, you do better. So for me, every day is a commitment to do better. Sometimes I succeed, sometimes I really don't. But here's my commitment to myself. To give up trying to be perfect. To be real. And give up trying to prove to connect. And in exchange, one conversation, one meeting, one presentation, one situation at a time, I get a chance, however small it might be, to make an impact. You know, in the theater, we call it drama for a reason. Every character is fighting for something. They want something so intensely that they are driven to make it happen. You are cast in the role of a lifetime. You get to play you. So I ask you, what are you fighting for? What is the impact that you are here to have on your clients or your team or your organization or your family? or this community, or on this world. Focus on that, for that is where you find your brave. And when you do, it's magical. Thank you. <laughs>